This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. I have got a great show for you today, but first, let me tell you about one of today's sponsors, St. John's College. From Greek philosophers who are the wellspring of democratic ideals, to America's founding fathers, to contemporary critics who question everything, each is welcome at St. John's College, where students encounter Adam Smith and Karl Marx, St. Augustine and Friedrich Nietzsche, James Baldwin and Virginia Woolf. Here, there are no secondary sources, no experts, and no one telling you what to believe. Rather, there are original sources and a community devoted to collaborative inquiry, intellectual humility, and the discomfort that comes from diverse opinions. Explore 3,000 years of human thought on campuses in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Annapolis, Maryland. For master's degree candidates, we also offer studies in the great texts of the East, in person or online. Learn more at sjc.edu slash reason. That's sjc.edu slash reason. sjc.edu slash reason. Check out St. John's College. My guest today is my reason colleague, Billy Binion. He's written blockbuster stories about the abuse of power by the police and the courts. And he just produced an incredible documentary about a citizen journalist in Laredo, Texas, who sued the city after they arrested her for reporting on a couple of controversial local stories. It's a case that could have major First Amendment implications for independent reporters and just about everybody else. I talked with Billy about what drives his interest in topics such as civil asset forfeiture, SWAT teams run amok, and the people who get arrested after using unlicensed guns to ward off would-be killers. We also talk about how his time living in California and Texas back to back over the past few years give him a unique perspective on blue and red America and what sort of government governs better. Here is the Reason interview with Billy Binion. Billy uh, Binion, it's a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure to be here. So uh, let's talk about uh, some of your uh, recent stories and your recurring areas of interest, because I think that kind of tells us who you are and what you're bringing to reason. Uh, we recently released a video documentary that was based on reporting you had done in the case of Priscilla Villa Real. Um, who is she and why should we uh, know about her? So Priscilla Villarreal is kind of a fascinating character who lives in the Texas border town of Laredo, uh, population, you know, like 250,000 right on the border with Mexico. And she calls herself a citizen journalist. So she is not employed by any local TV station or newspaper, um, but she is essentially the area's biggest celebrity, you know, when we were there filming, you could not go anywhere, you know, whether you were in an Uber or a coffee shop or restaurant. If you asked who is Priscilla Villarreal or who is, she calls herself La Gordi Loca, which translates roughly to the fat crazy lady. Um, she is known, and what is she known for? So she basically, a few years ago, she started a Facebook page where she would just do Facebook Lives uh, live, live streaming from directly from crime scenes or traffic accidents and has gotten this reputation for getting like really big scoops that the local press has not been able to get, um, a lot of which has been very critical of local law enforcement. And she has dredged up, you know, some of their misconduct. And so essentially, you know, that didn't sit so well with them a few years back. And so they leveraged a very obscure Texas law, the Laredo Police Department, leveraged a very obscure Texas law to arrest her for her reporting after she broke very two very benign stories. And those stories concerned a Border Patrol agent who had committed suicide and the a family involved in a fatal traffic accident. And so the irony is that Priscilla Villarreal confirmed the information for those stories with a confidential source in the Laredo Police Department. And then the Laredo Police Department turned around and arrested her. And so what did that... Uh, Texas statute actually say. So there's a this obscure Texas law that had never been used before um, that criminalizes soliciting non-public information 
if the person asking has the intent to obtain a benefit. And so that was essentially written to fend off, you know, you can probably assume corruption in government, bribery, right. that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, and this they, is like to so that you, you don't go to the uh, division of motor vehicle or something and they give right. you exactly information yeah. so you can start selling people something right. or whatever. But the way the police department contorted it was essentially – to interpret it in such a way that would apply it would apply to very boilerplate journalism as we all do every day you know you she called up a government employee she asked for a scoop you know non public information that has not yet been published is called a scoop um and she benefited from it in the form the government alleged of facebook followers and the reason that latter part is just so ridiculous is that every journalist when they are out there publishing benefits typically, I mean, if you're employed by an outlet, in the form of a salary. Uh, so it's this very, very spurious case um, that kicked off. The, the criminal charges were eventually dismissed. Um, but when she sued, the federal courts are far more divided on this issue than you think. I mean, you say you tell like a normal person this, I'd be like, of course, arresting a journalist, no matter how much you dislike them is clearly a violation of the First Amendment. This isn't Russia, uh, but th this was heard in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> Not yet. This was heard in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they ruled against her finally nine seven. Um, and the reading the decision is just kind of amazing because the the judge who wrote the majority, Judge Edith Jones essentially makes a distinction between Priscilla Villarreal and, quote, mainstream legitimate outlets, as if Villarreal is entitled to a less robust set of rights because she doesn't work for, you know, the Laredo Morning Times. Um, and that's no insult to the Laredo, Laredo Morning Times. But I was very interested in the story because not only is, is, is it kind of a um, an example of government unaccountability and just an interesting free speech case, but it also really forces people to ask themselves who qualifies as a journalist. Journalism, it's an activity, right? You know, if you yeah. have a phone, you can be, you can engage in journalism. Oh, no, and this is like we're in a golden age or supposedly, I mean, and, you know, going back to the 90s when I joined Reason, this was the whole dream of the internet and of disintermediated communications that we were all journalists because especially as we carry cameras and microphones on our phones, we can report live on things. Right. Um, so to see this turning that way, and it's fascinating how many journalists are like, oh yeah, I guess that's right. Like, you know, I, I, the number of journalists I know who are in favor of some kind of certification of journalists or saying, okay, well, you know, if you're a real reporter, that meaning if you work for the AP or the Washington right. Post or the Laredo paper, Right. You know that you you are in you're, you're entitled to protections, but not if you're the and we should mention that uh, Villa Real cuts quite a figure. She is a large hulking woman with a shaved head in the documentary that you do uh, the video. At one point, she's in a uh, barber's chair at a men's barber shop getting her head shaved. Right. Um, and she loves to, I mean, she's an, an, an amazing character. She's an amazing uh, character, sure. and she's also very layered. The reason she has a shaved head is because her niece um, had cancer and died, and she shaved her head, and this isn't in the documentary, um, but she shaved her head in solidarity with her and then just never stopped. So, you know, and I just find her so interesting because she cut. I mean, she's very brash. You know, one of the things that I think – the Fifth Circuit judges didn't like as if this should impact her free speech rights is that she's very profane. You know, in the, the she opens our documentary with a slew of, you know, she sees police sirens and I don't know, I'm allowed to cuss on here, right? Yeah. You're so I, she essentially, the opening of the documentary is something along the lines of you better not fucking crash into me, motherfucker. I mean, that's just how she yeah. that she yeah. goes to these crime scenes, live streams them, and just kind of like pops off. Yeah. And so a lot of people have kind of dismissed her right. um, as if, you know, because she's rough around the edges, that makes her, you know, that means her civil liberties yeah. should be weaker or something. I mean, that just doesn't oh, really it's, make it's, sense it's to me. It's a fantastic story and a, a frame to think about free speech because – it is, everybody's in favor of the First Amendment, right? And then you start to see all these people, or in the abstract, and it particularly when journalists start to be like, oh, well, that's not real journalism. I'm a real journalist because the whole history of the First Amendment comes out of not having to register or show the government what you're doing before you publish it. I mean, this goes back to the 
John Ping, Peter Zanger case in colonial uh, in colonial America. But you also in that story uh, in that documentary, you interview James O'Keefe, who's a fascinating character, uh, formerly of Project Veritas. He's got his own operation now, and he's another citizen journalist, right? He is absolutely not legacy media. I mean, he doesn't even run the group that he started anymore. Um, and you raise, uh, you know, you have kind of a pointed conversation with him, but that's the point, right? Like it's people like James O'Keefe who you may not, one may not care for his tone or even his methods, but as long as he's not breaking laws, right? Right. He, we need we need more people who are defending free speech without any but 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 right. At right, the end. I totally agree. So the reason I wanted to interview for people who aren't familiar with James O'Keefe, he is this sort of flamboyant, um, also citizen journalist, as you say, who burst into the mainstream. I want to say it was. 2008 or 2009 when he had he basically what he does is he kind of embodies these ridiculous characters and will go undercover and film himself or uh, secretly film himself interacting with uh, maybe government officials or cultural institutions that he takes issue with and he kind of tries to bait them into saying ridiculous things and sometimes it comes up with him just looking silly to be frank but sometimes you know his first big scoop basically shut down the left wing activist organization Acorn um, but a lot of people really don't like him because he does he lies, you know, to a lot of people mm -hmm. to uh, gain their trust. And Which is also something journalists often will do. Like journalists right. will, you know, they never present. I, you know, the, here is my set of beliefs, and like, right. I want you to confirm them. They they like to right. to talk to people under kind of dubious circumstances. Right. His most recent, I guess, thing that, that really grabbed headlines was he um, tricked a, a Biden administration official or someone who worked in the administration to going on a date with him, a man. And then he posted the man's Tinder profile on his, you know, on X to his millions of followers. Um, so he has ruffled a lot of feathers. That's the, the context I will give. Um, but he filed an amicus brief in support of Villarreal when her appeal was being heard before the Fifth Circuit. And I just thought this was very interesting because she's, of course, known for, you know, more of her left-leaning muckrakery and he's kind of more of a right-leaning culture warrior type. Um, but both of them have a lot of enemies. And so... I wanted to make the point that, and we do have a pointed conversation. It wasn't always uh, pleasant, I guess. But the point is that you see, you know, like another thing James O'Keefe did is he like filmed himself crossing the U.S.-Mexico border dresses Osama bin Laden. Like a lot of it's just antics that have made people not take him seriously. And I think a lot of people would say, why is this something we should defend? Like, why do we care about James O'Keefe's free speech rights? And the reason is, is because the rights of the many hang on the rights of the one, as uh, Greg Lukianov, the CEO and president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, which is defending Villarreal in her push to go to the Supreme Court, um, he says in the documentary, and I think that's very well put. I mean, if you even if you think James O'Keefe, if even if you'd really like him to stop talking, um, if you take away his... That's the whole protections point, from right? the government, yeah. right? I mean, you are really yeah. putting other people at risk who you do like, and yeah. the fact of the matter is, the principle is not a principle if you discard it when it's a little yeah. inconvenient. I uh, find it, you know, just to linger on the journalism dimension of this. Matt Welch, our reason colleague, has talked a lot about this. How many journalists and journalism professors and things like that talk about the need for shield laws that will protect. Uh, you know, people in the media from government action, but without understanding that that becomes a registry that says, okay, the state says right. you are a journalist, you have certain rights and privileges. You are not a journalist. You don't like, why would anybody in the industry, you know, want to do that unless you really see yourself as part of the power structure as an right. extension of the status quo, which uh, well, to cap uh, uh, via Riel's case, um, you, she's trying to get it in front of the Supreme Court. Is that right? Yes. And what what is the actual case that is being appealed here? So essentially, the the Fifth Circuit said that it was not obviously unconstitutional when law enforcement arrested her using this yeah. obscure law, and so she is appealing to the Supreme Court. To hopefully, I mean, so all the law enforcement agents involved got qualified immunity, the doctrine right. that makes it very difficult 
to hold state and local government employees accountable when they do violate the Constitution. Um, so I, I believe she wants the Supreme Court to make clear that this was a violation of the Constitution so that something like this doesn't happen in the future. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about qualified immunity. Uh, that is you know, one of your main beats. You look at the ways in which qualified immunity lets uh, law enforcement and other members of, uh, of various state, local, federal governments kind of slip the noose or uh, from being responsible. And that's kind of your mega, if I may, I, that strikes me as your, the mega theme of your work is how do we sure. hold people accountable um, who are in power. So uh, what is uh, qualified immunity uh, and its uglier cousin absolute immunity? Okay, so qualified immunity is a legal doctrine that was legislated into existence by the Supreme Court. So it's um, not legislated, right? That's it was it was conjured, right. legislated right? from yeah. the bench. Yes, right. um, right. as they say, but that is a you know poetic term. So you you are correct that people should know this was not passed by Congress. This was uh, what people would often call judicial activism, mm -hmm. um, and it essentially makes it very difficult for victims of government abuse to hold uh, gover state and local government officials accountable in civil court. And by that, I just mean via a lawsuit. So the you know layman's, the simplest way I can describe it is it essentially requires that in order for you to bring a claim against a government official, you not only have to exhibit that they violated your rights, but you have to show that it was, quote, clearly established in a prior court ruling that that uh, misconduct was unconstitutional. And I know that goes over lots of people's heads, so I'd prefer to just give a, a practical example. Um, one is one of the first cases I covered several years ago when I was first really getting onto this beat. Um, there were two police officers in Fresno, California that were accused of stealing – I think it was around $225,000 during the execution of a search warrant. And I should not be laughing at this because it is not funny, but it's – you have to laugh so you don't cry. The – in hearing the lawsuit from these men who had – who allegedly had this money stolen who were never charged with a crime. By the way, I think they were being investigated for gambling or something scandalous like that. Um, the Court of Appeals said – well, in theory, the officer should know that stealing is wrong, but there's no prior court ruling that says that stealing under these circumstances is wrong. And by that, I mean during the execution of a search warrant. So we cannot assume that a reasonable officer would know that. So you can't sue. And that's the point of qualified immunity, supposedly, right, is that it is protecting government officials supposedly from facing frivolous lawsuits so that only the lawsuits, you know, that are – that really have merit get through. Um, but what ends up happening is qualified immunity ends up stonewalling meritorious lawsuits on a technicality of, you know, this uh, – the, the fact that it didn't exist in case law. It's just so ridiculous because it assumes that police officers, you know, and it's not just police officers, prison guards, um, public university administration officials – are reading case law to know like what the rules are over their own training, which how is the often, dumbest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, how often is uh, qualified in immunity invoked? Uh, you know, it, it makes the headlines when it is, but you know, how common a practice is it? So essentially, any time a uh, local or state government employee is sued, qualified immunity is going to be invoked. But there's a two prong test, and this is kind of what. Um, what gets lost on people who really doggedly advocate that we need qualified immunity. Even if we were to get rid of qualified immunity, the first prong, which is that part where someone has to say, did this person violate the constitution or not? That would stay. Right. Qualified immunity is just that second part, which requires a plaintiff, the victim, to go on some wild goose chase to find a court precedent that exactly mirrors the misconduct they experienced. So you, when people say, "Oh, if we got qualified, if we got rid of qualified immunity, we'd have this on we'd this onslaught of lawsuits." No, would there be an increase? Probably, mm -hmm. yes, but it wouldn't be some avalanche because it's not like you can just sashay into the federal courthouse and file a lawsuit. You still have to show that someone in front of a federal judge that someone violated the Constitution in a list in a in a complaint that is reasonably believable. 
that right. makes sense. What is absolute immunity? So absolute immunity takes that to the next level and it essentially, I mean, there's basically nothing you can do. And that that um, protects people like prosecutors, mm-hmm. you know, district attorney's offices, that sort of thing. Um, I wrote a big feature for the magazine um, and I think it was our January 2023 issue about a prosecutor who had, you know, seemingly violated the constitution and it's basically just if a prosecutor does they can you know hide evidence uh from the defense which is blatantly unconstitutional they can knowingly and, and it false should be testimony. grounds for disbarment if not actual legal pres- right. like criminal well this pres- is the thing that's so yeah. frustrating is that absolute immunity that's kind of the argument for it from a lot of people is like, oh, well, you know, it's OK that we have absolute immunity because then bar associations will just punish these people. And when you and that was something I got into the piece is when you drill down to the data, it just like doesn't happen that much. Or it, like there are a lot of times when it just kind of flies under the radar. I mean, it's I guess it's not that surprising. You know, it's yeah, prosecu- it's. And it's also like if a prosecutor has absolute immunity and is known for like hiding evidence in proceedings or not doing full discovery. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's you're 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 probably unlikely to take any action against them because right. who knows what they're capable of. Right. Um, you have uh, written about some self-defense shootings, particularly in New York, that I find kind of fascinating. And this uh, there are there are. Two recent cases that you wrote about that, um, uh, one involving a guy named LaShawn Craig and the other Charles Fainer. But these are people who, in self-defense, um, shot and killed somebody who was attacking them. And they were not charged with any kind of you know murder or manslaughter or homicide, but then they get charged for using a gun or having a gun improperly. Can you sketch out what's going on there and why these types of cases, you know, really uh, land on your radar. Yeah. So the first one that really popped on my radar uh, was a man named Charles Foner. Okay. I think it was Thanks. June 1st of 2023. It was either very late May or early June. Essentially, there is security footage of a man attempting to mug him. And for context, this man is elderly. I think he's in maybe almost 70. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 2 a.m. You know, and he's just trying to go home and there's this guy who's like 30 years old coming after him down an alleyway. Um, and who eventually lunges at him, Charles Foner shoots him, kills him. The prosecutor's office agrees that that uh, shooting was in self-defense. And then they turned around and charged him with so many firearms violations because they searched his house after and found a slew of unlicensed weapons um, and charged him with so many what is essentially a paperwork violation for not getting the right license to have these guns, that if he is convicted on all of them, he will die in prison. Um, despite, like, as I said, the the district attorney says, like, we agree that this was self-defense and um, that's that. I mean, And but- this is in New York, a state that lost the Supreme Court decision and has done nothing about it, about having gun laws that are massively too strict, you know, by according to the Constitution and, and the Supreme Court. Um, so then you find a cache of weapons in a state where it's essentially impossible to to license them. What about LaShawn Craig? What is uh, what See, this one, case? I mean, this is I, I told uh, when I was covering the story, I mentioned LaShawn Craig's story to a friend and she had uh, a good quote that he is. This is kind of like a cartoon version of when you think self-defense is appropriate. Someone in a mask broke into his apartment and he shot the masked man. And it was a same the same thing where the prosecutor said, okay, we agree this was self-defense, but um, we're still going to charge you with this paperwork violation, which is a violent felony under New York law with a mandatory minimum. Uh, so it results in years long prison terms and you are forever branded a violent felon despite there, there being the prosecutor, you know, in both cases, acknowledging that there was no victim, you were defending your life. I mean, when you ha- when you shoot someone in self defense, the person who dies is not a victim, right? Um, Especially so, in your own house, right? I mean, right. I would. Uh, I recently watched uh, Kamala Harris's sit down with Oprah Winfrey, and Kamala Harris in the middle of that, where she's talking with. Uh, the victim of a school shooting, actually, they have her and Oprah have a little aside where she says, like, I own a gun. And if you break into my house, I'm going to shoot you. Right. 
you know, and it's like you. I honestly thought that was the most relatable thing she's ever said. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, and, and people kind of laughed and everything and it's kind of, uh, it's deeply disturbing to read about these cases where somebody is doing something, particularly LaShawn Craig, you know, who is just in his house and, um, where, um, where do these cases stand? Um, you know, are they, um, are these guys actively, uh, you know, are they in prison or are they, you know, uh, have their cases been adjudicated yet? There, those two cases I don't believe have uh, concluded yet. The case I've covered that has um, is pertains to a guy named Dexter Taylor, who um, also a New York City man, who I don't even like this term, but he made ghost guns, which I mm-hmm. think is kind of a you know pejorative term because you know, right. The idea but explain what they are. Yeah, so it's essentially. He made guns. He was he's a software engineer and was just interested in weapon science and like ordered parts and started putting guns together. Um, they were never used, so there certainly no violence and no victims. Uh, but he was referred to the police. A SWAT team raided his apartment, and he got ten years in prison for what I would like to reiterate is a paperwork violation. He will forever be a violent felon, um, despite. There was that there being no violence. Um, and I know that the Second Amendment and gun rights are just very polarizing topics these days. But this is one of one of those issues that I just don't really understand why it's not super tripartisan. And the reason I believe that is because, I mean, if you're on the right, of course, you're more likely to support gun rights. But the left talked a really big game for a really long time about victimless crimes. And in all of these cases I'm covering, case after case, you know, hefty prison terms, lifelong consequences, you know, being a violent felon doesn't just go away. Um, for victimless crimes, you know, especially in the case of Dexter Taylor, he didn't even use his case, in, he didn't even use his guns in self defense. Right. Um, and he's going to be in prison for a decade for that. I just right. don't understand how anyone defends that. You might have d- a different language you speak, whether it's because you care about the Second Amendment or because you care about pushing back on victimless crimes. But I just really think that that should be something we're all like, that's not right. You yeah. know what I mean? What do, well, what do you think? Um, explains it and and you know ghost guns are uh dexter taylor put these together basically from pieces that he ordered online and then they're they're not registered because the gun doesn't exist until you kind of put it together you could argue further i suppose and apparently unsuccessfully that it's not a gun until you fire it um i mean you know this because i don't i don't want to escape into kind of abstract uh logical reasoning or something but like it's you know it is it a gun really um but um you know why why do you think people don't care about these cases is it just it doesn't land in um you know kind of mapped ideological territory i mean i think what it really comes down to is especially people on the, and i don't i don't mean to paint with a super broad brush obviously people are com- complicated but Whenever I've published stories on these, you know, a couple of them have gone pretty viral and you get that onslaught of comments where it's like people just don't like guns and they don't like gun culture. And I actually would count myself in that, to be honest. I mean, like, I don't really like the culture around guns. I don't think, you know, I had that little dust up with Thomas Massey a few years ago with the Christmas photo and the, I mean, like, and I compared him to, he was acting like it was like a Kate Spade purse. You know, I, I, I myself am not a big fan of like, you know, the tough guy. I love, I like to tote my big gun around culture. Um, but at the end of the day, you have a constitutional right to, I mean, I think the most foundational right that should transcend all political tribalism is the right to defend your life when it is threatened and owning a weapon is a part of that. I think you have a right to do so. I think it should not be something that is uh, only accessible to people of a certain class. I mean, that was always one of the things I try to point out to people when they get mad about these you know, licensing cases like, well, they should have just filled out the paperwork. And it's like, well, let's take a step back. New York declines people arbitrarily all the time. It is extremely expensive. It can be hundreds of dollars. And, you know, people can roll their eyes at that. Hundreds of dollars is a lot of money There's to some people. a lot people. of money, yeah. Um, and it can be very time consuming. Um, you know, when that man broke into Sean Craig's apartment, I really doubt he was like, well, I guess I should have waited for my 
paperwork to come or I should have submitted my paperwork. You know, I mean, that's just not how life works. And I don't know. I think we are just polarized on everything these days. But guns, I mean, it's just one of those topics where it's just it's like abortion. It's like once you once you take a, a side in that you were just seen as like totally to, like you've been lost. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, it's, it's interesting with the Second Amendment, uh, you know, over time, it you know, and all of these things really are moving targets. But you know, there is a popular kind of argument around, which is more or less true, that, you know, Ronald Reagan would not be, who was seen as very pro-gun rights uh, when he was president, would not fit in the Republican Party now because he would, you know, he wanted a gun registry, et cetera, right. and, and things. Um, well, he and was of the course, one who was also trying to disarm the Black Panthers, right? Well, and famously in, in California, when he was governor, it was, I believe it was that you were allowed to carry of weapons openly. I don't think you could have uh, ammunition in them, but you couldn't do, you needed a permit for concealed carry, but not for carrying outside. And the Black Panthers famously exploited that by showing up in Sacramento with guns, you know, publicly visible, and then they changed the law. So there's always this back and forth. Um, but, and then I, you know, on the right, there's a hypocrisy there. And then on the left, I always find these kind of nuisance laws in a way, and I realize I'm kind of shifting gears here, uh, things like seatbelt laws for a long time. You know, that seems unobjectionable, the idea that, you know, uh, you know, you should wear a seatbelt and it might be mandated. And then I remember this was back in the day when uh, seatbelt laws were first passed. They were always seen as secondary enforcement laws, so you couldn't pull someone over. Uh, and the people who pushed them said, you can't pull anybody over for not wearing a seatbelt, but then if they're pulled over and they're not, that would be an add-on because what we're trying to do is encourage people to use seatbelts. And then almost as soon as the ink dried on all of these, the seatbelt legislation in the 80s and early 90s, then they became primary enforcement. And then, you know, I would explain to people that gives the police, you know, a whole new suspicion, say, well, I thought he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. So I pulled the car over and then you see like who who is more likely to get pulled over and it's poorer people it's people in shitty cars it's it's minorities and you know there's a whole kind of um cascade effect of these laws that end up hurting you know poor people and you know who might be disproportionately uh you know racial or ethnic minorities but i i wish that we we're in a better place as a society to have this kind of conversation. And, you know, talking about filling out paperwork, it is daunting, um, you know, and especially imagine going like if a hundred, a couple hundred bucks is a lot of money for you and you have to go and fill out paperwork saying like, I want to buy a gun or I already have a gun. Like you, of course, you're going to be, you know, nerve wracked about all of that. And why should the government, if you're not doing anything wrong, why should the government even give a shit? But. Right. And this is when I really do think that this is an issue that should resonate with people who have liberal values, which is that if you support those permitting regimes that make it very difficult for poor people to get guns, you are making the right to self-defense something that is only accessible to people of a certain class, which is just insane. That doesn't make any sense. I thought we were supposed to be I, people on the left. I thought, you know, this is a group that wants to stand up for the little guy. Um, and as I said, the right to protect your life. I, I don't understand how that's become like a Republican thing. That doesn't make sense to me um, or a libertarian thing. To me, that really is an everyone thing. If someone – you should be able to protect your home and your family. That's just very obvious to me. Whatever your political beliefs, I support that for you. Um, you've also written a lot about um, people, innocent people, I'll add, um, whose houses were blown up by SWAT teams. Uh, what's a good example of that genre of story that you uh, come back to over time? So there are a couple. There are uh, as a, are two different types, and I'll make a distinction. They're both crazy. Um, but in the first type of case I'll mention, essentially what has happened is – Fugitives on the run from police will barricade themselves inside someone's home or business. And in order to get out that suspect, police will just like do a full on assault on the home and kind of like blow it up, um, causing, you know, costing many, many thousands of dollars in damages. 
And so when, you know, there, for instance, this was, there was a man in Los Angeles who I covered who had a print shop. You know, he had he was an immigrant, I think, from El Salvador. He had built it up for decades. Um, and it took, I think, like an hour for the Los Angeles SWAT team to just totally destroy everything inside of it, his, all, his total livelihood. Um, and because a suspect had barricaded himself inside. And so when he asked the government for compensation, he's like, you know, I understand this was in the interest of public safety, but like, can you give me the, I think, 60 some thousand dollars that you cost me because now I'm working out of my garage and I'm having trouble, you know, paying my rent um, and you know, making any money from my print shop because it's gone. Um, and the government basically said, well, no, that's not our problem. Um, and that's the typical response in a lot of these cases. And, of course, the natural response is like, well, why didn't he have insurance? A lot of insurance policies, which people don't realize, specifically do not cover damage caused by the government because they expect the government to cover it. So you have an insurance company, and these similar with a lady I covered in Texas. Her home was blown up um, when a fugitive barricaded himself inside. You know, tear gas everywhere. Uh, every like her possession, not just the structure of the house, but like they bulldozed through the front door. You're know, throwing tear gas grenades everywhere. Um, I think it was sixty some thousand dollars in damages, and it was the same response for the government. It was like, well, this just isn't really our problem. Um, and so people have been suing uh, under the idea that that violates the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment, which promises that the government gives you just compensation if your private property is taken for public use. And the idea being that the public use here is protecting public safety from fugitives. Then the other type of case is when the police just get the wrong address and they they have a target and this person is accused of maybe a heinous crime um, and they read the address wrong or something or they don't look they don't you know there are some cases where people will be like well I just didn't read the warrant all the way through and it's like okay um, and they might you know of course the same kind of story a lot of these SWAT entries rely on you know shock and awe so they're just like throwing bombs everywhere destroying like shattering windows left and right uh, and then when people sue, uh, it, in the cases I've covered, the law enforcement gets qualified immunity. Um, the, what we were talking about before where it, blocking these people civil suits for having their houses totally destroyed because of an error. Are police officers human and going to make errors? Yes. But I think it's something that we should all be able to agree on that if you, know, you use the monopoly on force and power to make an error that totally upends someone's literal i mean like that's a house is everything to most people or nearly everything to most people and um especially many poorer people which is who this often happens to and a lot of these people are just left with nothing immunity yeah. what would be your uh, preferred i mean it, it i guess it depends on the case and you know going back to questions about qualified immunity if the city you know or the the local government whatever unit of government is responsible like they should have to pony up to make people whole if if they've made a mistake. Um, and then I guess within some of those cases, if the government can show that its employee acted contra to all of their training or all established guidelines or lied about, you know, what address should be on the uh, search warrant or something, they that individual might be uh, liable for civil or criminal penalties. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I think for, I don't know why we don't have, you know, we should have a robust insurance policy for this sort of thing. You know, we have insurance policies in so many other areas of government. Yeah. Um, and the, and like governments don't have insurance policies for, OK, if we do something fucked up and. Right. You know. I, I should I think I just misspoke. Insur we have insurance policies in so many areas of life, I should say. And for some reason police departments have been very resistant to the idea that these sorts of settlements should come out of an insurance market. Um, I don't see, I don't, I mean, I, I think that just makes sense. You know, the idea that, yes, people are going to make mistakes, but imagine, just imagine if, if we were held to that standard, the little, us, the, you know, in the private, in the private world, just a little guy, if we, if, you know, you owned like, owned like a theme park and you just like, made a mistake on your ride and killed a bunch of people and you 
were actually expected to have, I mean, you you yourself expected to just evade any sort of responsibility for that. I mean, it's just wild. And these are the people that we are forced to employ. I find it, I find it insulting that you know, the people who enforce the law just kind of expect to be above it. And I, I, I reject the idea that holding them to some sort of accountability in these cases where they do abuse their power or they do just get it wrong is somehow going to, you know, make them too tense to do their job. No, I mean, we should, you know, in one of the cases I just covered where the SWAT team got the wrong house, um, the Court of Appeals legitimately wrote that it was reasonable for them to get the wrong house because it was dark outside. And because it was dark outside, um, they, you know, it was hard to make out the address on the house. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. If you are about to blow up someone's house, if I was about to blow up someone's house for work, I would check that number. I would do whatever it took. I, I mean, like, that's such a, that's a huge mistake to make. Um, and of course, I mean, there's not just the structural damage. There is the absolute trauma that that inflicts on a family who, like, is woken up in the middle of the night and thinks someone just bombed their way into their house. I mean, I, I, that's something that's very difficult to get over. Do you think, and this this is in the context of larger discussions about uh, bad behavior by law enforcement, do you think these, are these events increasing or is it more that they are either kind of staying the same or might even be declining, but that they are more visible because to go back to that citizen journalism, you know, because we have more, there are more eyes on the street. Everybody is watching everybody else. I think that... It's hard to know. I would I make the argument though, and I have made it before, that I do think policing is getting better. I think that the activist impulse that you see on like Twitter and just, you know, in general activist circles, to argue with a straight face that, you know, police killings are at their highest ever. Um, to be just like a completely dishonest reading of the data. And it might be well-intentioned. You know, I think a lot of activists, they really do care about this issue. They want the world to be better. But also activists, you know, if your activism ends, you lose your purpose. You know what I mean? So I think that there is kind of an incentive to ignore the fact that, yes, of course, policing is getting better. To argue that policing hasn't gotten better since the 70s when there was like no hardly any sort of, you know, talk about citizen journalism. There, no one had an iPhone to like record someone acting out, but there was also just like much more of a culture of impunity because there wasn't, there wasn't, you know, even as much of a media spotlight. The media was much more um, deferential and they yeah. still are in some ways deferential to law enforcement. Do you but think way things, even more so. things have changed? Uh, you know, I, I guess the, the current, moment in a lot of law enforcement uh, reform or or kind of analysis uh, probably dates back to Michael Brown in um, in Missouri um, but uh, in the early teens but then obviously you know literally and figuratively uh, George Floyd's death at the uh, in police custody in Minneapolis really you know set things on fire do you feel like um, we are are we going back to an era where people are saying, uh, you know, there's nothing to see here, move on, and like trying to sweep uh, abuse at the um, state, local, or even federal level when it comes to policing broadly defined under the carpet? Or um, are we getting back to a sense of sanity where the things that are bad are really bad and they need to be addressed, but we also should not be acting as if the, you know, you know, it's, it's open season on people perceived as criminals. I do not think we should be acting as if it's open season. And the reason I say that is because I don't think that panic really serves as much of a positive force in any, I mean, panicking about something just objectively doesn't really do anything to solve it um, other than, you know, putting people in a place where they are so paranoid that if they're pulled over, they're going to get gunned down by the police officer when, I mean, and statistically, that is quite rare and people should know that. And people should know that just so they don't go about living their lives in abject fear. Um, I will say one of the things, though, that has been discouraging about how this debate has kind of proceeded um, is, I mean, this is applicable to many things, but it does feel like a lot of policy debates and criminal justice is objectively a policy debate has, has been overtaken 
by just kind of like tribal culture war stances where it's more about vibes and feelings and realities that exist only in people's imaginations. And, and you can say that on the activist left, but you can also say that on the right where you have people who are like back the blue no matter what. I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. The fact when you look at the Pew polling, the vast majority of the American public supports basic, um, you know, accountability measures for police officers who are constantly acting out. It's something like 90 or 95 percent don't want them to be able to just keep going to different departments when they get fired, which is often the case, often what happens. And to the point about George Floyd, when the qualified immunity conversation really popped, which I will say Reason had been covering it doggedly before that, um, but when that conversation really popped, for a moment, it just really seemed like this was going to be a tripartisan, we can all agree that the little guy should have recourse when a government agent violates the Constitution. And that just kind of went away because it, be it became associated with defunding the police when qualified immunity has nothing to do with defunding anything. It is a legal doctrine that was brought into brought to life by the Supreme Court. It doesn't have to do with budgets. Um, I guess you could, I mean, I guess you could kind of tie it up in terms of, um, you know, police paying out settlements, but the taxpayer is paying those. I mean, it's not like it's not coming out of police officers' pockets. So uh, that's the thing that I find very frustrating and very difficult in talking about this conversation. You know, it's it's not just the left who is, you know, creating these realities that don't exist. It's like everyone is just talking about things. That, like I said, these are realities that exist only in their imaginations. And it's very frustrating. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about where you uh, where you come from, both literally and figuratively. How old are you? I am 33. Okay, uh, that's a uh, biblical age, um, at least the New Testament. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, and uh, uh, where'd you go to school? I went to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Okay, and so um, how how does being from Richmond, how does being 33, how does going to UVA, um, how does that shape you? That's an interesting question. I mean, I grew up in a very conservative family. Um and was always, I guess, a little bit of the black sheep. I would say in college, I always knew I was very politically homeless, but I just didn't really know what that meant. Um, and I, I graduated college during the Romney-Obama matchup. And that was when I was like, okay, I really just feel like no one really speaks for me here. Um, but I guess a little bit of background about me. My, my first career was in uh was involved in the arts and i had majored in music and worked for a couple of years singing in the ensemble at an opera company and was thinking about going that direction so i my point being that i um was more focused i knew i knew it didn't fit into like a political camp but i was more focused on you know studying how to sing opera <laughs> um and so i worked at virginia opera for a couple of years in their chorus and was like wow i really hate this and it was kind of like what, my life what did you hate about it i mean that's what you wanted right or it was what I wanted. And there's like a very specific, I wonder if some of your listeners will be able to relate to this. There's a very specific identity crisis you go through when everything you worked for or that you thought you wanted like very clearly isn't what you wanted pretty much. And you notice it right away after years of working towards that thing. Um, why didn't I like it? I think for, okay, so I always use this um, comparison. Have you seen Miss Congeniality? That fabulous movie. When she's doing that interview and she's like, um, you know, talking about how they're all like waiting for each other to fail and for each other to fall on their face. Um, I very much just felt like that. I mean, it's uh, it was in a low stakes environment. I, I wasn't singing front and center, but you know, I was getting ready to do graduate school auditions, and you know, was around all of these top tier singers who I just I don't know. I kind of felt like it's it's not a great environment. You know, you you are always kind of auditioning, even after you're in rehearsals. You do always kind of feel like. You're auditioning for the people who are in charge and um, that, you know, the people who you're competing with, they're your friends, but they also kind of want you to fail because sure. that will mean more they, Yeah, they're, it's kind of, exactly. zero, it's seen as zero sum. Right, exactly. Right? And I also did some, you know. It's all about Eve all the way down. Right. right. 
and I, you know, I did lots of theater too. And you know, I, when I did have more of a, my, one of my favorite roles was this Jimmy Harper in Reefer Madness. If anyone is familiar with that, there's a rock musical based off of the propaganda film to scare kids away from smoking weed. But even in something that was a little, you know, less rigid and something like that, that's not opera, I would still come off stage and be like, that was wrong. That was bad. That could have been, that high note could have been better. And I think live performance is thrilling, but it just, to me, it was hard to find fulfillment in it because of all of the pressure and neuroses around it. Um, Do you think more fully, uh, when when you think about kind of the theater community or the performing community, um, are there more people who are politically homeless there than kind of let on? Because this is you know, in dealing in stereotypes, people will often say, okay, well, you know, people in the theater community, uh, people in Hollywood, uh, writer, you know, novelists and poets and things like that, they're always left wing. Um, you know, and you can throw, you know, T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound in their faces. I'm not sure you want to. Or, you know, there were a ton of major stars in Hollywood in the 50s and 60s who were Republican, you know, or ultra conservatives even. But are are there more politically homeless people in, uh, you know, in the creative world than we are led on to believe? There definitely is a pretty big level of groupthink. Mm -hmm. I would say, especially when it comes to the social progressivism, which is mm -hmm. moving really quickly, you know, and especially in terms of gender mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of thing. Um, I'm sure, though, that there are people who are like closet cases, though. Absolutely. Yeah. The problem is. If you out yourself, you do risk not getting hired anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're definitely risking because it's a very small group of powerful people that you know are decided. And there's like 20 opera companies left in the United right. States. It's like really sad. Another reason why I didn't. Like that think is I wanted... sad to you, to those of us who don't care about opera. That just seems to be, you know, the way that's of the, the world. I guess that's nobody, the nobody cares about novels the way that they did when I right. started grad school to study literature. So it's right. Uh, um, but I mean, you, I, if you piss people off in a certain way, you know, you, you're risking your livelihood. And I think that definitely weighs on people. So I wouldn't at all be surprised if that was something that played into it. Um, but anyways, when I was kind of realizing I didn't want to be in the performing arts anymore, at least not in any sort of professional way, I was like, well, what do I really like doing? Well, I had a... a I had a, a stop at um, as a defense contractor, not to, not to um, scandalize your... V listeners, but um, a dr the director's wife and Reefer Madness actually was like, how are you liking your life? And I was like, well, not so much. And she was like, well, I work at this place called Booz Allen Hamilton. And so I ended up um, doing defense contracting at NATO, which is randomly on a base in Norfolk, Virginia. And so when I... Um, when I took that job, I was originally doing event planning and then... Um, kind of weaseled my way into doing media. And so I was like, you know, I really love telling stories. That is the reason I liked opera and theater. I think I just, I'm fascinated by people and their stories. And so what better way to do that than to try my hand in journalism? And so I made the move to DC and at this career change, I remember being like, if I don't like this, I give up. <laughs> I've tried, I've tried to find things I like, but I loved it. And I am so grateful to have to have landed here especially. Yeah, when did you join Reason? Um, 2019. Yeah, wow. Um, and you have uh, lived, uh, you're in D.C. now, but you you started out in Richmond, but you've lived in various parts of the country. What, um, you know, what do you have to, um, what are you, what's, what's your sense of uh, the country beyond the kind of Northern Virginia uh, world? Yeah, so I did, grew up in Richmond, college in Charlottesville, work in Norfolk, D.C., then I moved to L.A. And that was, I mean, I just honestly was looking for a culture shock, especially as someone who only lived in Virginia and D.C., which is basically D.C., I mean, Virginia light. It's like right across the, I mean, different in character, but like you literally just cross a bridge. Um, and then, yeah, so I went to L.A., got my culture shock, wasn't for me. Um, very beautiful place. Poorly mismanaged, or that's redundant, mismanaged. Um, and, you know, Absolutely breathtaking vistas and an amazing symphony. When you and say opera. mismanaged, what do you mean? Politically. Yeah. So on the basic infrastructure level, or yes, I would say that I, I, the taxes are insane. I mean, I I don't mean to sound like hackish, but 
it's one of those things where you pay, you really do pay so much to be there and you just look around and you're like, what the fuck is this getting me? I don't see it. Like, I don't get, I don't get where this is going. I mean, one of the most vivid memories I have there as I kind of was like thinking about, okay, maybe this isn't for me is, you know, of course, a lot of the taxes they say is going towards helping homeless people. I don't know how to fix homelessness. I'm not going to act like I do. It's going to take someone smarter than me to figure it out. But I lived in this apartment in Koreatown. And I was on my way. I had, you know, I had met a friend for dinner and I was think I was going to CVS or something just on a errand run after I'd gotten back. And I looked to my left and there was this huge fire in front of my building, like feet away, um, because the homeless encampment that lived outside of my apartment building had set the sewer on fire to kill the rats. So there was like a 20 foot fire and then they were playing whack-a-mole with shovels to kill the rats. And I just looked at it and was like, you know, I shouldn't really be desensitized to this, but I am. Like, I'm not even surprised. Like, you know, there's like just a short roadway between me and something that could literally burn down my entire apartment building. And no firefighter's going to – I mean, no one's going to – no one's going to intervene. Um, and like I said, I don't know what the I, – I, I, if these people are suffering, I do not mean to – you know, deride or to make fun of them. That's not the point of this. But I more so was just like, I pay so much money, allegedly in part, to help people in this position. And it's not doing anything. And I'm, I, I don't know. It just, it felt like living in LA, the best way I can put it, living in LA felt very difficult. It felt, it did not feel easy, you know. And it's just also just a very fractured place, you know. It feels like a bunch of small towns. I mean, you spent time in LA. It feels uh, like a yes, bunch of I've small towns. I've lived there twice. And uh, right. I mean, the one thing I'll say about it is um, on a very basic level of, you know, kind of like streets being paved or sidewalks. Uh, Reason famously uh, some years ago did a story just about LA sidewalks. And like they are catastrophic. I, you know, there's trees growing through them. They're cracked. And these are the most basic types of things. Um, you know, DC has its problems as well. I live in New York now, uh, which also like you, you know, it's disturbing when you're living in a place that is, you know, it, 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 uh, takes a lot of tax money and it's not even getting the basics down. Right. Um, and that's you know, how and it then, feels. And it's because yeah. it's not even, it would be one thing if it were like, you know, some small, you know, a, a small part of my paycheck just mysteriously disappearing and, and living in disarray. But it was like, I mean, a lot of money that I really don't know where it went. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, now, so, speaking of which, you you spent time in Dallas as well. So, right? and uh, so, as my LA time came to an end, I was like, "Where to next? I'm going yeah. to Texas." So, talk about that because California, and I think we overlapped in uh, California in 2020 or thereabouts. But you know, 2020 was not only the pandemic year, but for the first time, basically since it joined the union, California saw a net population decline year over year because right. of COVID deaths, but people also moving out. Because California is a high tax, high regulation state, you took off to you know the one of the poster children of a state that's doing it right. How did you feel about Texas? I really enjoyed my time in Texas. I really did. I mean, I didn't move there like it. It was another culture shock for me. So when I I didn't move there like you know kind of chasing that Texas aesthetic. You know, I'm like I'm not like much of a cowboy, <laughs> if you know me. Um, I, although I did really want to buy a cowboy hat when I went to the rodeo, just to say I did, but it was too expensive. Um, those things are really quality, um, and I knew I would never wear it again, so I did not buy it. But um, I I did enjoy my time in Texas. To your point, though, about the Exodus, I will never forget. I was looking for apartments. Essentially, I went to visit in March 2022, like fully for it, just intending to be a visit. And then just was kind of like, well, LA sucks. So I guess I just won't leave. Um, and I started touring apartments probably in May after staying with a friend for a little bit and um, giving it kind of a test run. And I will never forget going to tour an apartment that was probably like, they probably quoted me around like 16 or 1700, which isn't that scandalous. But he had, he said in the winter, so what we're talking like five months prior, five or six months prior, it had been 1200 And I had never even heard of a rent increase that substantial. I mean, you hear about that over years, like, you know, maybe over five or six years or more. I had never heard of that. 
you know, basically what it equated to a hundred dollars a month. I mean, but there was like a running joke that a bunch of Californians were flooding Dallas. Um, and I went there because I have, I had a lot of, uh, a few really close friends for different parts of my life. And, um, you know, I didn't feel like starting all the way over again, but I really enjoyed Texas. I mean, I knew, I knew it was never going to be super long term, but it's very spread out for me. You know, I love, I'm, I just moved back to DC, like literally 72 hours ago. So, um, I'm still getting used to it again, but I love the East coast culture of walkable cities. Um, like, you know, DC, New York, Philadelphia. I love that. Um, the DFW area is a little too spread out for me, but you know, to not to invoke a, a stereotype, but I did feel find that the people there are just very kind and I made tons of friends and really enjoyed that and I also wanted to go there to be honest because I know a lot of people in the media do get criticized often rightfully so for never living outside of these really kind of coastal elite bubbles DC New York LA and I had basically only done that and it was it was instructive to be in a place where like like some you know people are still very deeply conservative and I mean that shouldn't sound so weird but like when you're living in DC DC for instance they vote 93% with democrats it is hard to find someone especially culturally conservative you know even the republicans you mean here are probably still okay with gays you know what i mean so it was, it's just interesting it was i, I think a good exercise did um, you encounter go. much uh, you know outright homophobia in Dallas though um, well, Dallas is kind of a blueberry in the tomato soup. So I wouldn't say I encountered outright homophobia, but like, you know, I had some close, super close family friends who, well, I, close friends that have become family who live about an hour outside of Dallas in the country. And, um, you know, some of their friends, I think, were not down with it. They don't think it's like a, a good choice, um, a good way to live your life. And I think people look at me. Uh, People would look at me very strangely if I said that was a good experience to be around that. I mean, I say that, though, because, like, no one was anything but kind to me. And I think it is good to be reminded that, like, not everyone thinks the way you do. And you have to be able to to get along with that. You know, we, we still – I would go to dinner with these people and – um it's it's fine. I thought they were lovely. You know, I'm I, – How did it, you stumble into libertarianism? Um, and do, do you consider yourself a libertarian? Well, I work at Reason Magazine, don't I? Yes, well, I can. Yeah. So how? <laughs> I, uh, and I you, do. you've used the term throughout this uh, conversation, uh, tripartisan, which I like a lot. Um, well, because uh, I don't want to say bipartisan because that erases us. Because I definitely mm -hmm. am neither Republican nor Democrat. Right. So or, yes, I am nor a conservative nor a liberal. I guess in the way that that usually. Yeah, I guess I like the word liberal when we're referring to like the classical sense. I mean, that's kind mm -hmm. of like the yeah. the Reason Magazine mantra. I do not. I mean, I'm not like a. 2024 liberal. Um, but I have, I would say I have liberal values. Um, how did I stumble onto libertarianism? So when I was working that NATO job and was like, I want to break into journalism, I started looking at journalism fellowships. And I was going through just the listings online and I found one fellowship at a think tank or an, or an institute rather that, um, they outlined everything they believed and it was kind of like my light bulb mom my light bulb moment i was 25 and as i mentioned earlier you know i i knew i was politically homeless and i knew the basic contours of what i believed but i didn't know where the home for that was and so i found this uh, journalism fellowship that outlined you know they were uh, you know opposing law enforcement misconduct and, and you know pushing back on you know arresting people for victimless crimes sticking up for free speech uh, pushing back on crony capitalism and I was like wow check 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 this is me um and it was the Charles Koch Institute which of course scandalized many of my friends and you know tr I honestly was not very familiar with them at all um I was just kind of starting to get interested in being a, a part of that world I mean this is almost a decade ago now but I read what they stood for and I was like, oh, this is me. I finally found it. And so I was accepted to their journalism fellowship and was placed at an organization called All Sides, which essentially writes and analyzes news from left, right, and center. Um, and it's, I mean, they do some blogging, but it's mostly curating. It's kind of, The idea is kind of like to break your filter bubble and have a balanced news diet. But Reason was a part, like they were one of the job recruiters in that fellowship and Christian Britschke, who is now our colleague, um, worked 
worked there through the fellowship. And I just was like sitting on the side and was like, that's where I want to be. So um, I applied for Reasons um, editorial internship in 2019 um, when I was probably too old to be an intern, but I masqueraded as well. <laughs> oh, you're never of, too old. It's like one law of the school, youth. you know, um, or, or an acting career, you know. Um. Hey, honestly, so, yeah. follow your dreams. That's what you're on our, one thing I actually do believe is we are all on our own timeline. So yeah. we'll, we all That's figure right. it out, but or we hopefully figure it out. Yeah. But um, so I was our intern and then Catherine asked me to stay and it's been right. truly a dream come true. Uh, let's finish on a um, kind of positive note or, or maybe one that gets towards a tripartisanship or at least less polarized. Um, you've also written about uh, how the Supreme Court is not as, um, you know, kind of polarized as we think. You know, this is one of the legacies of Donald Trump uh, was that he was able to really pick a bunch of Supreme Court, you know, a, an uncommonly high number of Supreme Court appointees. And that has led to a lot of discussion about how, you know, now there is a ultra conservative supermajority on the court and, you know, uh, gnashing of teeth and rending of garments will commence. You have actually looked at this and there's a lot of substantial ideological overlap on the court, or at least their rulings. Uh, what's going on there? So I find this fascinating because the media narrative, as many people have seen a lot of over the last few years, is that this is the most radical, pol not just polarized, but radical Supreme Court that we've ever seen because it is such a conservative majority. And I'm obviously not contesting the idea that there is a conservative majority. Of course, there is a conservative majority. And people are certainly entitled to take issue with that. But when you actually look at how the court rules, for one, they're often unanimous. Uh, earlier this term, you know, at the start of the, the start of this last term, 15 out of 18 rulings were unanimous, which was is historic in its unanimity. Um, and at the at the end of the term, you know, you, we hear a lot about those six three rulings. Half of those were ideological splits. The other half are just some weird mix of people um, with totally different ideological bends that just come together on an issue. And the, the, to me, the capstone piece that I, I wrote on this was when Katanji Brown Jackson voted with the majority that um, thousands or hundreds, either it was either hundreds or thousands, but many January 6th defendants had been improperly charged with obstruction based on an overly broad reading of the law. And the person who wrote the dissent and said they had been properly charged by Merrick Garland was Amy Coney Barrett. And so that's, those are the stories. It just, it, it gets under my skin because that is such an interesting story. It is such an interesting story that Katanji Brown Jackson is writing about how January 6th defendants uh, were basically over-criminalized in some way. And it is a story about how – it's a very rich story about – because, of course, she was a former public defender, um, which is very rare to see on the Supreme Court. Um, and she was sitting there. It was a great opinion. She was applying her principles consistently. She was – you know, I think she knew when – you could tell in the opinion, like, she knew this was going to ruffle some feathers – but she also understands that prosecutors have a bit of a habit of getting creative with criminal law, and that's not how this should work. Um, so, I mean, it's a story that a lot of journalists just don't seem to be interested in, in telling. I mean, another really good example is um, when the Supreme Court ruling came down uh, in Rahimi for the the, the gun case with um, the person who was accused of domestic violence, you know. Shannon Watts, the the founder of I think it's Moms Demand Action, the you know gun control group, she tweeted it was just the, that even the Supreme Court took the case is just such an indictment of how radical the court has become. Well, the court eight one overturned the fifth circuit first fifth circuit ruling in favor of this guy and ruled that. The government was allowed to disarm him. So Shannon Watts and, and gun control activists should have been very happy with that ruling. And all of Trump's appointees voted against him. But she 
And a lot of people, I don't mean to just pick on her, a lot of people just like look at any Supreme Court ruling, any Supreme Court uh, case that comes before them and is just their gut reaction is like, this just shows how radical and polarized we are. And it's like, well, that's actually not the story a lot of the time. And the real story is more interesting. Yeah. Do you feel um, right now that the Supreme Court is a force for um, libertarian values of, of limiting the size and the power of the state, or is it not really clear? I don't think it's totally clear, but I actually am hopeful. I mean, I thought like, for instance, the ruling in Chevron, um, which kind of reigning in the administrative state, that was another one of those ones where I'm just like, I don't, I, I'm skeptical that people really are um, bothering to take the time to understand the implications of these things, because of course the response to Chevron, which you know the Chevron Chevron deference allowed um, these bureaucrats to exercise very wide authority in interpreting the law, and so many people were like. The Supreme Court overturning Chevron is undermining democracy. And it's like, actually, the Supreme Court overturning Chevron is forcing lawmakers to be specific, which and is then about to democracy. make it even more complicated. They were dealing with a Trump era agency that had overstepped its bounds. Right. I mean, that's right. And so it, you know, and Trump had come in claiming that he was going to dismantle or deconstruct the administrative state, and he expanded it, and the Supreme Court has chipped away at it a little bit. So, right. Um, do you feel uh, that we are we're getting maybe uh, are we getting to a place, or how do we get to a place where people um, say, okay, you know what, I'm done with these, uh, you know, kind of simplistic. Uh, conservative or liberal or progressive narratives, and like, let's actually see what's going on. Um, you know, are are we are we becoming wiser as a people, or are we becoming just kind of dumber and more willing to say, okay, you know, at some point before I was born, Chevron deference was seen as a right wing cause or something like that. You know, o overturning right. it. So if whatever it is, I don't know, but I know I'm against it if I'm on the left or I'm for it if I'm on the right. Right. I think we're getting dumber. I, I'm sorry yeah. if that's the okay. non-optimistic, <laughs> unoptimistic take, but like, and this is always why I'm, you know, I think that there should just be more options in political life. I don't even think, I mean, this isn't even me advocating for, you know, a robust libertarian. I'm not like a, it's no secret to people who, you know, follow me online that I'm not really a big fan of the current iteration of the libertarian party. So like- <laughs> You know, this isn't me saying, oh, we need to elect, you know, specifically people yeah. from the Libertarian Party. Whatever. We just need more choices because I do feel like one of the reasons we have such a binary way of talking about these issues is a reflection of just our system writ large. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and, and a media that basically picks sides to mirror that. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm just glad something like reason exists, that yeah. like there is... There are still, you know, I would like to think a few publications left that are willing to be like, okay, actually the story is more complicated. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, the more complicated story is the more interesting one. Yeah. You know, it's the it's it has richer characters and mm -hmm. and richer motivations and um, life is just a lot more complicated than people, you know, want to believe it is. And I think that's the point of journalism, right? Is like interrogating the the gray areas and not yeah. just accepting that everything is black and white. If everything were black and white, life would be really fucking boring. Yeah. Um, where's the best place for people to find you on social media? Um, I'm on Twitter, X, whatever, at Billy Binion. That is my real name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hard to believe. And, you know, on all the other ones, too. Okay. Uh, and I, I will recommend that people follow you, uh, particularly on Instagram and uh, Twitter, or X, whatever we're calling it. Um, because you you have a uh, unique way of framing stories that like oftentimes just burst out and you do a lot of kind of direct to camera uh, videos that are also uh, quite engaging, uh, particularly on Instagram and YouTube. So uh, Billy Binion, it is uh, good as always to talk to you and uh, thanks for your work. Thanks for having me. This has been The Reason Interview and I've been Nick Gillespie. Thanks for listening and uh, catch you next week.